Good morning, Southside Bible Church. It's good to be back to worship with you guys. The Lord was merciful to me on vacation and restoring my soul and just being my all and all. So thank you for prayers and cards and just your kindness to me. Thank you to the leaders who preached us through Malachi. What a blessing. And for Ray, while the leaders and wives were on a retreat, uh, God blessed that richly and so grateful for Ray and bringing us the Word of God. Well, let's continue now our worship through the pre... Wait, one second. Announcement. So they, they mentioned next week we're starting this class. Um, so anyone who, who's going to be teaching in it, especially those who go and do the evangelism and uh, with, the college, with the young disciples and all that, would love to have you guys help be leaders in this. So 15 minutes after the service in classroom Z for those leaders, it's going to be a, about a five-minute meeting to go through what you'll need to know for these books and uh, how we're going to go through them. And then for the regulars, when you show up next Sunday, you'll get a book then. So just wanted to encourage you that excited for us to lock shields and help each other grow in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let us continue our worship through the preached word of God this morning. And I just want to make sure that you understand what I mean when I say that. This is a, a worship service. And we come and we sing praises to our God and we hear from our God. And right now it's you and God with his word and just let him speak to you and speak to your heart through Romans this morning. So continue your worship with, this is the word of God speaking to you. And so don't check out, come worship uh, as we look at this word this morning. So let's go to our God and ask him to do that to every heart this morning. I love that picture of the few loaves and fishes and Jesus feeds the multitudes and that he would take these few words and he would feed us this morning and nourish our souls on the word of God. So let's go to him and we'll pray and we will open this word this morning. Father, I come before you and I thank you for the privilege to be back worshiping with the saints of God. I thank you um, for Jesus Christ. And I pray now, Lord, this verse that it would be the verse, the life verse of every heart sitting in this room this morning. And so God, don't let this just be us going through motions. Let your spirit work deeply into minds and hearts, sift, plow, set free, do mighty things in our midst as we open the word of God this morning. And so I, I pray that you would get all the glory and the aroma of Jesus Christ would fill our gathering this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So before I went on vacation, I was blessed to preach to you Romans 12.1. If you'll turn back there, Romans 12.1. So three years of laboring in this letter, week in and week out, I couldn't leave on vacation until I, I preached the, the therefore of Romans 12.1. One. And so we tackled that the, the Sunday that I finished up five weeks ago. But as we start this morning, five weeks demands some review. So I want to start with kind of the aerial overview, kind of a macro look again at Romans as we start. So Romans 1 through 11 is the doctrinal body. It's, it's the truths of the gospel, what God has done to save mankind. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of God to bring men, women, and children into the realm of salvation. For in this gospel, it is revealed that it's through faith, the righteousness of God of how to be right with him. And so we've just gone line upon line, precept upon precept, looking at the truth of the gospel. We saw eternity past. We've looked at eternity future and everything in between. And we learned all that God has done in Christ to save sinners. And we saw that history exists for God to show forth his mercy in Jesus Christ for his glory. It is a gospel of grace, God's doing, so that everyone will worship God. And when one gets the mercy of God in Jesus Christ, when you see that, you're taken up with his mercy. 
You can't look at this gospel and just say, that's nice. It takes your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. It just comes up and says, I want to love God and love other people. I've been taken up in the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. And what happens is Romans eleven thirty three. you cry out, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Worship is restored to fallen creatures like we heard in that testimony this morning. God is put back in his rightful place in our hearts and in our lives. And this gospel puts him at the blazing center of your life. He is what must be worshiped. And in Romans 1, we're, when we were in sin, we, we worshiped the image of an image of an image. We worshiped idols. We worshiped ourselves. We, we were so broken. We all sinned and lacked the glory of God. And now through the gospel, we cry from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That's what the gospel does in hearts. Thank you, Lord, for restoring your glory to its rightful place in my heart. Isn't that a gift? I love it. So the gospel must bring you to that place. It's not just a bunch of doctrines and creeds and confessions. You never get over this place that simply put, if, if you get over it, you've missed Christianity. The gospel brings you back to God. And that is what we come here to worship. The God that we have been reconciled to. And now this gospel also brings another kind of worship. And this is what I'm going to call the forgotten worship of our day. There's so much talk about our singing about what we sing during worship service, and that has really gotten its, its float in the parade. And so much so that when one thinks of worship, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind when you think of worship? Most often today, it's what do we sing? It's the songs, it's, it's gathering and what we just did. And while that, I'll never downplay that. Romans eleven thirty three through 36, you just can't worship God enough. You can't sing enough praises to him for his greatness and what he's done. Don't downplay it. But Romans 12 through 16 is very important to the Christian life. The two are married. These two worships are married. You can't have one without the other. Worshiping God by your life and worshiping him with your tongue. And the minister that marries these two things together is called therefore. Therefore is what brings both worships together. The gospel causes you to sing worship praises to God and the therefore connects now a life that goes and says, I will give my life to worship you, God, to serve you. And they're going to be joined by this beautiful word, therefore. So that's the minister in the marriage, therefore. Therefore. And so this morning, we're going to look at our spiritual worship under the new covenant, everything we've been studying. What sacrifices do we offer up to God now as believers? <clears throat> Romans 12, 1, we offer up our bodies. This is your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12, 2, you're going to prove what the will of God is. You're going to live God's will now. That will is going to be flushed out in detail in the rest of Romans, we are going to look at what does it mean to worship God by our lives and the way we live. It's just going to get more and more detailed and clear and clear what this gospel does in a heart. So my prayer for Southside Bible Church is that our singing worship would be full of praise and glory and honor to our King. And I pray that the form isn't what causes you to worship, but the person and that you can worship God anywhere, to any music, to any form, because of who he is and what he's done in Christ. And that our worship would be whole-bodied and whole-souled to serve God. 
Alexander McLaren said, the meaning of being a Christian is that in light of a whole Christ who gave himself for me, that I would give my whole self to him. I'm so fired up. Don't lock me away for five weeks again. <laughs> we are going to learn how to do that, and we're going to learn what it looks like practically. So will you pray with me again that as the deer panteth for the water brook, so my soul longeth after thee, O oh God. Father, create that in every heart. We've worked so long and hard staring at your mercies, God. They're infinite and they're abundant and they deserve response. They deserve worship from the fullness of our hearts praising you. And they deserve lives every day that are offered up as living sacrifices to serve the King of Kings. So God, will you do that in every heart here this morning, please? Don't, I'm just tired of motions. God, let every heart surrender to you and to you alone because of your mercies this morning. Meet us here and do what no human being can ever produce or do. God, through your word, by your spirit, let this be the worship of every believing heart, I pray. Amen. Well, this morning I want to finish up our outline from the last time that we were together in Romans. So if we could pop that up on the screen, I'm going to show you five considerations to guide us in our response to this great salvation that God has given to us. And the first one is the connection, then the compelling nature, I urge you, the compassion, brethren, the controlling drive, the mercies of God, and fifthly, the charge to us. And that's where we kind of left off last time, the new worship under the new covenant to offer up your body as a living and holy sacrifice. So let's begin. Turn with me to Romans 12, 1. The first point then is the, the connection. And we've talked about this for years and years and years, so I won't overdo it again. But therefore, connects everything together. So we always ask ourselves, what is it there for? And the bottom line is you have to build your life on something. And you got to sit here before God this morning and say, what am I building my life on? What's driving everything that I'm doing? There's a therefore in your life. You just got to make sure it's connected to the right thing. Your life does not just hang in the air. Everyone lives their life based on something. There's only a few ninnies walking around that don't base it on anything. But there is some principle or belief that drives what you do. And we said last time that Christianity is the only religion with a therefore. No other religion has a therefore. You're always working and hoping you can get something. It's the only religion that when it turns now to your life that says, therefore, there's something that has been done in the past for you by Jesus Christ. And there's something that is coming in the future, the return and all that God will do then. And I believe them. I entrust my life and my soul to these truths. And by faith, alone, I am made right with God. And now my whole life, everything that I do is driven by my faith, by a truth that I behold the gospel of Jesus Christ, therefore drives my whole life. I, 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 it has, it's accomplished something amazing. I'm justified before God. I sit here this morning with no condemnation from God. The dominion of sin has been broken. I'm a new creation on the inside. I am indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God who is going to finish the work that God has begun. I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace. I had a funny illustration this week, and I'm going to throw it out there. Is I got the joy, my son went to Spain, and so I got his one-year-old for a whole week. And this one-year-old talks about the newborn baby in our family named Teddy. And it was just, Teddy, Teddy, 
Teddy. And, and we're going over there. And I'm like, we're going to see Teddy. And she's so excited. And we get there. And she spent the whole time looking at the picture of Teddy on the phone. And I'm like, Teddy's here. <laughs> Teddy, Teddy, Teddy. And as a pastor, you're going, Moses, Moses, let me perform. Let me do better so that you'll love me. And Jesus has come. Come to him. Come to Jesus. Quit looking at law and Moses trying to get right with God. The gospel is he fulfilled the law in your place and he'll give it to you by grace through faith. Therefore, I'm not under law any longer. I'm under the grace of God. Therefore, it's why I've labored for three years in Romans. I just want every one of you to have a therefore this morning and not working to get a therefore. It's miserable. It's miserable. I want you to rise up from your tomb and take off your grave clothes and rise and go for, forth and follow him. Loved, accepted, justified, future graced, and go worship the God who gave you this great salvation with your tongue and with your life. Therefore, it's compelling. I urge you, before I... I urge you, please, live for God. This country's going to hell in a handbasket. Are you going to go there with it next week? Don't be conformed to this world. I urge you. It's just growing in my heart for myself and for you. I urge you, and the compassion is my brethren, we battle sin, we crawl off, we get uh, drawn into the world, enticed, we go back to wrong worldly thinking. We're just prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. And so, brethren, repent, turn back to God and find times of refreshing and renewal. And, and what we're going to look at now, look again at the mercies of God to restore and refresh your soul wherever you're sitting here this morning. And so the controlling drive of the whole Christian life, he says, is you do this by the mercies of God. And I just can't get over this. I was driving to a meeting and just looking out at all the trees changing colors and the sun was shining on a sinful, sinful city. And I'm loved by God. He sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He died for me. That's not a fable. It's the greatest reality that has ever happened on this earth. He died for me, and I just keep studying it. And 30 years of laboring in this word, looking at it in Hebrew, Greek commentaries, listening to sermons spanning thousands of years, praying, meditating, and it just gets sweeter and sweeter, and sweeter. His mercies are abundant and eternal. And, and they're in the plural. Doesn't that make sense? Instead, of, I, by the mercies of God, because they're infinite and abundant, they're just infinite. I urge you by the mercies in the big old P, capital P for plural, there's no end to them. They're new every morning. And I'm telling you, the one who gets this when you finally see the glory of God in the face of Christ, you're just taken up with it the rest of your days. I, I've been at this 30 years and it's just so fresh. Give me time off and it gets fresher just staring at it and reading and meditating on it. The, the, the saints who get it, they're just worshiping God so beautifully in word and in deed, no matter what circumstance comes into their life, you just squeeze them and worship and praise just keeps coming out. This is the worship that Paul's talking about. There's going to be some really hard things asked of you in Romans 12 through 16. Maybe a persecuting government, maybe a hard trial. The things are going to be asked. The question is, are his mercies enough? 
can you keep looking back at his mercies and saying, they're, they're enough, they're sufficient. Nothing can squelch my love to God and love to others as I look at these mercies. So every time I get dry, weary, it seems like it's too much, uh, whatever God's asking of you this morning, look at his mercies. I urge you, by the mercies of God in Christ Jesus, offer your body up to him and do what is right this morning. No matter how hard it is, the mercies were harder on that cross. Those still under the law, so little worship. Those under the grace of God and seeing it more and more, just worship oozing and coming out of your life. Oh, that we would live like those who have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Infinite, abundant, eternal riches of mercy. They're the fuel to a life well lived to God. They're the fuel of our spiritual act of worship. Amen? And this is the kind of speech that comes out of that kind of heart David Livingstone, one of the famous missionaries to Africa, when he came back in London, he kind of became a mythical hero <clears throat> because of all the sacrifices that he did to go take that gospel to Africa. And he was speaking at a college, and I just want you to hear what he said. He said, people talk of the sacrifice that I have made in spending so much of my time in Africa. People talk of sacrifice is that a sacrifice which brings its own reward? Peace of mind and a bright hope of glory in the near presence of Jesus Christ? Away with such a word, away with such a view, away with such a thought that this is any kind of a sacrifice. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say it's a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, danger now and then, being afflicted multiple times with malaria and dysentery, with the foregoing of conveniences and the charities of life, he begged as he went forth through all the tribes, oftentimes without food and days and nights. These things may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and sink. But let this be for a moment. All of these things are nothing. He's saying, I never made a sacrifice. Why? Because of the mercies of God. And I pray that's what your heart gets this morning. I've never made a sacrifice. What a privilege. One last thing before we move on, and I, I think it's big for the next year that we're going to go into Romans, is, is when you're taken up in God's mercy, you will show mercy. <clears throat> Look with me into Romans 12. Let's start in verse 8. He who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy, let him do it with cheerfulness. Verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints practicing hospitality. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless those and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Don't be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own um, estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Verse 19, never take your own revenge. Leave room for God. And he just, verse 20, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When you get the mercies, you show mercy. And everything we're going to study from here on out is merciful people. And, and this is what our land is dying for, is true mercy and real mercy, not writing people off. Mercy. And so I just want you to see the therefore is the mercy of God in Christ. Therefore, go show mercy. Just, you're so full of the large-heartedness of God towards you that you have a large heart towards others, a real, sincere, genuine heart the gospel produces in us. This is where we're going to go this year. So the Christian life is worshipful. 
God has shown mercy to us before it can ever be merciful to others. If you sit here with no mercy in your heart, it's because you haven't seen the mercy of God in Christ. Fifth, the charge. This is our last point in verse one, and next week we'll take verse two. To offer up your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. So Paul says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. It's the last time we're together in Romans. We just started unpacking this a little bit. We kind of went to Old Testament worship is where this word uh, has all of its heritage and meaning. Uh, you, you would come in the Old Testament worship and you, you bring a bull or a goat or lamb, whatever it was, and you come to the priest at the altar and the sins are confessed and the throat was slit and the blood would be poured on the altar and then the body of the carcass would be burned. And it was a symbol of a sacrifice for your sin, of a substitute who would die in your place for sin. And every true believer knew that that animal was pointing to something better coming, the Isaiah 53 sacrifice who would go up on a cross and die in our place. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 10 said, he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. And so all of these sacrifices were pointing to the sacrifice. Jesus was that lamb that was slain for our sins to take away the sins of the world. His blood made propitiation. It, it drained the wrath of God. It removed it. And so now we need a new kind of offering as the people of God. The, the sacrifice that all those sacrifices was pointing to happened. To tell us die, it was finished. So it was once and for all. So we don't bring sacrifices now for our sins to God because Jesus did it. It's done. He's had the sacrifice. So what now as new covenant believers do we bring to God in our worship then? If I don't bring goats and bulls and doves and all of that, what do I bring God now? You bring him praise and worship. You worship him that from him and through him and to him are all things. You, you come in here and you sing praises to God from your heart. You praise him all day long, all week long, we worship God. And then we come before God without a lamb, and we come into his presence by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and we say, here's my offering, Father. I got no bulls or goats. I give you my life. That's all I have my life. I have died to Ken Murphy, and now I live to Jesus Christ. The life that I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's my sacrifice. I give you everything. Take what is yours. A whole sold offering. Just been meditating for over a couple weeks. Why do I have a body? God, why'd you give me a body to pamper it, satisfy it, make it beautiful or try to? <laughs> have others approve it, have people worship, appreciate it? No, we died to that. That's what we were in Adam when we had self-glory as our basis. We've been saved from that, guys. We've been set free. We've been taken out of being in Adam in the dominion of sin and self-worship. Now we have a body for one reason, to use it in service to the one who loved me and gave himself for me. I have a body to serve God. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my money, my time, that beautiful hymn. I give you everything. It's yours because of the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. Jonathan Edwards has said he ate a very careful diet as to what made him feel the best and give him the most energy to serve the king. And we're like, how, how can I eat the most and not get, gain weight? I just want to indulge. Give me everything I can do instead of all I want to do is figure out how I can keep this body in shape the best way to serve God. <laughs> what, a, 
What a condemnation to America in the way we think about bodies. Come out and be separate. You have a body to serve God. Let all be done with this body for Jesus Christ. For me to live as Christ. And as we look at this new covenant life of worship, Paul gives us what's going to characterize it. If you'll look in verse 1, three adjectives. This body, this sacrifice is to be a living one, a holy one, and one that is acceptable to God. And I want to look at those and then we'll close out. <clears throat> the first adjective, it's to be living. This is a present, active, participle. I'm going to be doing this every day. It's a living sacrifice every day. God, I'm yours. Don't miss this. The Old Testament sacrifices were dead, and the New Covenant sacrifices are living. Romans 6.11, reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. I'm alive to God. Spurgeon said, it seemed like all men were dead compared to George Whitfield. He was just so alive. And that's what should be said of every one of us. They're just so alive to God because of his mercies. Day to day, my life is my offering of the worship of God. Everything I do is for him. At work tomorrow, I'm going to worship God by the way I work. One thing I learned this week, I just want to come hug every young mom and dad. <laughs> do it for God. Do it for It is so hard for God. You guys need more encouragement. Do it for God, moms and dads. Do it. Every diaper and wipe and hearing them ask for the same thing a hundred times over again. Do it for God. If you're sick at home, those who couldn't be here this morning and haven't been here for years because of sickness, just be the aroma of God in your home, trusting Him and your trial. Flee youthful lusts for His name. It's why I go to bed early on Saturday nights. I just want to worship God with a clear mind and be fresh. Why you meet people in need. Why you do everything that you do. My life is my New Testament worship to the God who has mercied me in Jesus Christ. I can't get over His mercies. Here's my life. Every day, all day. It's living it's way better than a dead animal. And it's to be holy. And it is set apart for the service of God. It is dedicated to God. Holy, it's, the, it's the, more the idea of how it was used in the worship of God is what he's hitting. And so in the temple, you would have the, the, the things that were set apart, the showbread and all the different things, the holy utensils that were used in the temple. And so it was holy because it was only to be used for worship. You, you didn't take the utensils from the tabernacle and go eat dinner with them at your house. They were set apart only for the worship of God. They were set apart for his service. And now you're holy. We've been set apart by God for him and him alone to make much of him with these things that are called a body. Here it is. That for you, God, you're Paul said, you're not your own. You have been bought with a great price. Haven't, wasn't it a great price? I was listening in Sunday school this morning, and that was a great price. He says, therefore, honor God with your bodies. Glorify God with these bodies. Don't use them for common use. Don't mix them in the world and use them for worldly things. For your good, your gain, your pleasure, fill in the blank, whatever you want, your gaming, your passions, your kingdom. They're not yours. You were crucified with Christ. You've died. Your life isn't yours anymore. The mercies of God purchased you. These bodies and life are yours, God. They're yours. 
holy. I'm holy set apart to you. I just don't get up in the morning and say, what's going to make me happy today? You've died to that. Just get up. God, how do you want me to live for you today? How can I use this body for your glory? I am holy and separated to God. Use me however you want. Lord, that's my question every morning. I still love that quote by Wesley. They asked Wesley, let me get a drink of water real quick. They asked Wesley, I can't remember if it was John or Charles. Um, I know it's not Wesley Buenaventura. It's Charles or John. And if you knew the Lord was going to come back tonight, they said, what would you do different? And he thought about it and he said, nothing. I'm going to go down to the, to the poor today and I'm going to preach the gospel and I'm going to feed them. And then I've got a service at this time and I'm going to visit a widow in the evening. And he went through his whole day and he said, nothing would change. And so what I put to you this morning is if Jesus was going to come back tonight, what would change about your day? And if everything would change, you're missing it. I pray that every day, everything is consecrated to Christ and his service. Holy. I'm God's. And acceptable, the third, third um, adjective. A sacrifice, he says, that is well-pleasing to God. I want it to be like, have you seen my servant Job? There's no one like him on the face of the earth. <sighs> Pleasing. Romans 14, 18, when we get there, for he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Hebrews 13, 21, that God would equip you in every good thing to do his will, which is what we're looking at, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, therefore we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent from the body, to be pleasing to him. Just want to be pleasing to God. And he finishes it up. He says, which is your spiritual service of worship. And this last clause modifies the whole verse. And so here it is, offering up your bodies, living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. This is your spiritual act of worship. It's only two Greek words. Uh, there's a lot of difficulty in getting to the essence of their meaning. And so I'm going to save you hours and hours of what I had to labor through and just kind of succinctly bring it to you. The first word is latreia. And this word conveys both worship and service. It was used uh, in general of the ceremony and of the offering. And I think that Paul chose this word to deliberately create a contrast between the Jewish and the Christian form of worship. And for the Christian, he's showing you there, there's no more sacrifice in the literal sense. It's, now, it's not come with a, a dead carcass but it, again, come with your life and offer it to God. And God is saying, it's not so much the gift that I want. I want the giver. I want your heart. And the Jew, would, he, he looked to the Jerusalem temple as a center of worship. That was the life of the Old Testament worship. And now the life of the New Testament worship is we look at the finished work of Jesus Christ. We look at him, we stare at him, we believe, we look at the mercies of God in Christ. And now our worship service is not confined to one time and one place, but all places and at all times we worship. Jesus Christ has made it where we can worship 24-7 anywhere and everywhere. Christian worship is not practiced at sacred sites and sacred times and sacred acts now. It's the offering of the body at all times in the sphere of this world to God. And this tying in this worship of singing in our lives. John MacArthur has a quote I want to read. <laughs> he said, music and liturgy can assist or express a worshiping heart but they cannot make a non-worshipping heart into a worshipping one, which says a lot if you need that to make your heart worship. The danger is that they can give a non-worshipping heart the sense that they worshipped. 
You can fill your churches with unbelievers and they're going to walk out going, I worshiped. So the crucial factor in worship in the church is not the form of worship, but the state of the hearts of the saints. If our corporate worship isn't the expression of our individual worshiping lives all week, it's going to be unacceptable. If you think you can live any way you want and then go to church on Sunday morning and turn on the worship with the saints, you're wrong. It just won't happen. So it's a call to worship. And the second word is logaken, and it's translated here, spiritual service in the NAS. And again, a tricky word to nail down. It's kind of got this idea of the spiritual, the, the inner, a worship that involves the mind and the heart as, a, as opposed to just going through the motions. It's rational, it's reasonable, or even if you sound out the word, it's logical. A worship that is appropriate to those who have truly understood the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. And so the TEV translation calls it true worship. And that's the translation I like the best. Is to, this is your true worship, genuine, not motions from the heart. And what Paul is calling for here is the antithesis then of that which is mechanical. And we, we, we looked at Malachi 1, didn't we? God saying, I don't want your mechanical worship. I wish you would shut the door instead of giving me these leftovers, mechanical worship. And, and I'm just afraid so much of worship in our land and maybe our own church is mechanical. And it needs to come from this gospel and the mercies and from the inward and the spirit being written on the heart. It's not, let's go give our sacrifice of worship it's not external and mechanical. We sing songs, but this is one who's enraptured with the mercies of God in Christ. He's not worried about a lamb. He's just so focused on the lamb of God, praises. He comes to God and says, here, God, in light of your mercies, I give you my life. I am yours. I'm the sheep of your hand. And so God isn't pleased with rote religion. He doesn't want your motions. You've got to wrestle with it. It's not just, this is what Christians do, so I do it. He wants your heart. He wants your life. That's what all of Romans has been leading us to, and I've been praying for a revival for three years, and maybe this morning, this is it. Has the gospel produced that in your heart? Worship and a life offered up to serve the King of Kings. That's what the mercies of God produces in a heart. And some of you don't have it. And you're just doing more mechanical and rote things and it will never change or fix the problem. Go back to the mercies of God in Christ until you see it or your heart says, here's my life. God, I offer it up to you. And I'll tell you, you will battle with sin uh, you will have all kinds of fights against this the rest of your days, but at the core of your being, because of this gospel, I just want to give God everything I have till I enter into his presence. That's what the gospel does to a heart. I'd like to tell you it's okay to be dead, cold, no heart for Christ, but I can't. You're in danger. It's not, it's not where you want to be. Go back to Romans 1 through 11 and stare at the mercies of God in Christ. And I don't care if you got 30 years of church attendance under your belt, that's not going to get anything. Stare again at Jesus Christ till my heart is yours. It's not go to church, sing songs, give some money, hear a sermon. Say hi to some people and go home. Feed the poor in a mechanical way and memorize verses in a mechanical way. I love my wife in a mechanical way. Guys, this is huge. The external form of religion, natural moral acts, the rote and mechanical is not spiritual worship. A heart and love with God in Christ, wanting to live holy for him is your worship, 
your spiritual act of worship. That's what the therefore demands. Therefore, offer up your body as a living sacrifice to God. My greatest burden is that I want to give him more and my sin keeps tripping me up. But what these mercies do, it just wells up within my heart. I just want to serve God and others. And every time I get weary, I come back to those mercies and it just starts over again. That's the, that's the fuel for the Christian life. And I've got a whole bunch of verses to read, um, but I think because we went through Malachi, I'll skip them all because I want to get you guys home. But I will read John 4, 23. Jesus said, an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit from the inside and in truth, the truth of the gospel. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. I don't want, wrote, that was the whole Testament. I don't want that junk. I want people's hearts. I want their worship to come. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It's never been about external worship. Don't be happy with just a shell. God is saying, I don't want a bunch of dead animals. I want your mind and your affections and your will. I want your service, your hearts. Those are the worshipers that the Father is seeking under the new covenant. Not a bunch of people that just took old doctrine and got new doctrine, and they're still just cold, dead, rote things. That's not what he's after. I want worshipers in spirit and in truth in the new covenant. And I've done everything in my son to produce that in your heart. What is it about Jesus Christ that makes you not want to give him everything? Can you show it? Yell it out. But there's something about Jesus that doesn't just say, I want to worship him. I want to give him everything. I, just, I, I can't find anything. I find things in his people that make me go, oof. But I can find nothing in him that would ever make me want to do anything but offer up my body a living sacrifice to Jesus Christ. Let it not be said of us, Jesus said this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. And so as I've prayed and meditated on this passage, I've asked God, show me the heart of this passage. And we'll just close with this. Worship is ascribing glory and honor to God, and your life is the exact same thing. My life is ascribing glory and honor to God that he's worthy of, his, of service to him. You're the only object worthy of my service. You alone are God. I believe that, and everything exists for you, and that is what is good and right. And then I'm not here for me. In light of the mercies that you've shown me, love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. By my life, I ascribe glory and honor. Do your name, God. I want to hollow your name every day by the way I live my life for God. Disobedience, God, you're not worthy of my devotion and my service. This quick look at my computer screen is more value than you. This pie is more satisfying than the mercies. Me getting my way is more important than walking in your ways. This is where, this brass tacks, where it all comes for the Christian life. What will be your response to the mercies of God? Will it be a spiritual worship and service? That is the only fitting response to the substance of Jesus Christ. The shadows will not cut it. And so I pray if you've come here this morning that you will not go out of here saying, I just got to work harder for God if you're not a Christian. I pray that what you need this morning is the mercy of God. The chief mercy is that he came into this world as God born of a virgin and he lived a perfect life in your place. And then he went up on a cross and died the death that you deserve for your sins against God so that you could be forgiven and made right with God. So I, I offer you Jesus Christ to come to him and receive him by faith and not by cleaning your life up and trying to change. And then this will begin to change you when you drink up these mercies. And so Southside, let's worship God by our bodies. Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you for this beautiful passage, this beautiful therefore, the transition. God, I thank you that the mercies are the new covenant. I don't do this because there's a sword over my head, disobey and die. We do it now because the sword was pierced through the Son of God in our place. And now here's my life. Take it, Lord, it's yours. Help me to quit believing lies and going after other things and thinking they'll bring life. God, bring healing to the body. Let this be a time of repentance for not worshiping you the way that you are worthy and the way we ought. God, wash us and cleanse us, creating us a clean heart. Oh God, renew in us a right spirit. Let us testify and tell sinners of your mercies and your kindness that we have found in Christ. God, I thank you for this time. And I pray that you bless the, the people of God this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.